Good morning. This is chapter four, temperament in children. This is the beginning anyway. Um, we're on page 97 from our book, Please Understand Me, Character and Temperament Types. The Pygmalion Project, so visible in mating, goes underground in parenting. A child, after all, is supposed to be different from an adult. It is only later that our offspring must end up a chip off the old block. But throughout childhood, this is quite unconsciously reinforced. The parental focus is on what the child does, not on how he experiences what he does, and on how he is experienced by others, not on how he experiences himself. The unwitting assumption is that everybody who does the same thing experiences the same thing. So the issue is action, not experience. Now, I'm pretty sure that's clear, guys. It's the mist coming off the water before the sunrise. All right, we continue with the temperament in children. If they are of radically different temperaments, Two children doing precisely the same thing will have radically different experiences. And the adult who presides over these two experiences, whether parent or teacher, who remembers what it was like when I was a child, is usually dead wrong in attributing a like experience to his two charges. Acting on the unwitting assumption of likeness, this well-meaning adult is very likely to disconfirm and remain impervious to the children's perspectives. On occasion, the ever-benevolent adult will, based upon attribution and imperviousness, even intrude into the private space of the child as if the child were robotic. So there we have the four horsemen of the apocalypse of childhood. Not pestilence, famine, etc., but attribution, intrusion, imperviousness, and disconfirmation. Loosened by the benevolence of the parental other on the unconscious assumption of likeness. gonna have to listen to that again. It's a hell of a little paragraph there. Nature will no more allow a child to come into this world temperamentally formless than she will allow a snowflake to be asymmetrical. Children are different from each other from the beginning and no amount of preachment or conditioning or trauma for that matter will diminish that difference. So let us consider the problem posed by this ubiquitous difference. Here is a parental other, an ISTJ, trustee, father, an ESFP, entertainer, mother, with one INFP, monastic, one ISTP, artisan, and two ESFJs, vendors, as offspring. And then we've got a, another one of those little fancy charts here. Let's see if I can get that out there so that you can see that there is a chart. Let me see if I can get you some light. There we go. It's kind of giving us an idea of what might happen if your parents was which one. So, and our little story here. My baby boy snoring in the back again, in case you can hear him. Compound the problem, if you will, 
by making ISTJ Father a person of great physical strength, endurance, and athletic prowess, which he never used being a CPA. His ISTP son is small-boned, like mother, slender, poorly muscled, average in intellectual ability. Mother was once a chorus girl, pretty, effervescent, sparkling. Both parents understand the two ESFJ girls perfectly, or so they would have it. The INFP girl is not pretty, is the youngest, is understood as having trouble becoming one of the family. Her brightness is completely missed. The ISTP boy just hasn't buckled down yet, but he doesn't dig the buckle. The problem would seem to be somewhat complex, for the moment at least. We ought to admit to being at a loss for solutions. Now, let us look at the teacher's dilemma. Here is a fourth grade ISFJ conservator, female teacher with a class of 32 splendidly different boys and girls, 12 SJs, 12 SPs, 4 NTs, and 4 NFs. For convenience, let us assume that our conserving teacher seats the children in rows and columns. SJ teachers typically find appeal in the traditional seating arrangement. For further convenience, let like be seated with like. And again, I have another little chart. Let's see if I can get that to you. Come on, baby. There we go. Uh, that's not a very good job. But there's our chart. Just a gentle reminder, you can always pause it. That's why we're doing the videos so that you can pause it and see what you might have missed or know what to Google search. All right, here we go. Now, if this particular teacher sees her job as seeing to it that all of the children do their work neatly, diligently, and on time so that they will develop good study habits and eventually become dependable, helpful, honest, and responsible citizens, ready, willing, and able to do their part, then she has an SJ version of what school is for. She will set out to get the children to want those things coveted by SJs. The children are regarded as all the same in this. True, some of them may not yet realize that they want obligation and belonging, but then that is the teacher's job to bring them to this increasing realization. Any messages to the contrary from the 20 children who don't get their jollies from the SJ corner are instantly, albeit unconsciously, disqualified. They are met with attribution or imperviousness or disconfirmation or even intrusion. That's if she doesn't realize that many of the children are incredibly different from her and from each other. But suppose she has come to realize this ubiquitous and unchanging difference. What then? Is she to approach these children differently? Is she to give up her otherwise unquestioned perspectives on the very purpose of school? Must Instru must instructional tactics differ for different temperaments? Must instructional content differ for different temperaments? Is she, for instance, wise or foolish if she poses the same assignments, explanations, and questions 
for those five ESFJs in the front rows, as she does for that lonely INTP in the back row. These questions arise with the temperament hypothesis. If the hypothesis is abandoned or ignored, then we might suppose the teacher to be free to continue treating everybody as if they were destined to emulate her. But once she has embraced this the hypothesis, she finds it a fatal embrace. Fatal, that is, to all beliefs about the process and product of instruction. These now must be abandoned and then retrieved one by one, only if they can be used in the service of fostering the emergence and development of each child's unique style of living. We sure as hell don't need 32 ISFJs, even if it were possible to metamorphosize them out of the 32 children that aren't that way. That, of course, could be said for any type. The teacher plainly has a very difficult problem. Solutions, if any, will be hard to come by. But facing the problem even without solutions is infinitely better than for lack of solution, pretending the problems don't exist, and consequently disqualifying almost all the children's messages to their detriment. The teacher is said to act in locos parentis, in place of the parent, and surely has the same job as parent, so nothing is lost. And there may be some gain in thinking of the teacher as the parental other along with the fa father, mother, grandmother, and so on. What is the parental other to do in the face of the complexity ushered in by the notion of basic differences in children? First, of course, the parenting individual must acquaint himself or herself with the nature of those temperamental variations. Then and only then can the question be asked upon each encounter. What kind of person am I encountering? And on that basis, what sort of messages from me will define the relationship in a facilitative and productive way? True. The necessity of posing this question to ourselves makes all of our relationships with children problematic and, at first glance, lacking in spontaneity. But a closer look shows us that this question makes for spontaneity rather than limits it, and it is the previous and hopefully abandoned perspective. My children are underneath, just like me, which precludes spontaneity in the relationship. So, to the familiarization. First, let us look at the four differences positioned by Jung. Introversion versus extroversion. Sensation versus intuition. Thinking versus feeling and judgment versus perception. As these differences show up in children's behavior, even though the pattern of behavior probably comes from temperament rather than Jung's preferences, there is some utility in making observations having this in my, these in mind. Following this, we can look at the four temperaments as they manifest themselves in childhood. Finally, we can examine the four temperaments as they affect teaching. All right, I'm gonna stop here. And then I'm gonna start back over with this breakdown. So we've got extroversion versus introversion, um, sensation versus intuition, thinking versus feeling, and judgment versus perception. That'll be on the next one. And I I think that some of the, how it works with children 
has been kind of helpful for me because of um, understanding the influence of others um, on, on oneself, not just maybe how my type influenced my own children but how maybe I was influenced by my own parents or maybe a favorite. There's some teachers that have just like really stood out throughout my whole life. And they, it was just a small period of time, but they had a way of speaking and interacting with me that was different. And I understood them and it was just a different. So those types, maybe they were, we had temperament in common is why they, affected me so deeply and I carry the some of the stuff I learned from them all these years so um, I'm getting a, a lot out of this book I hope you're enjoying it and I will continue because we did not catch that sun rising we caught a lot of birds and some beautiful mist thank you for listening thank you for being with me this morning I appreciate you